Welcome mamas to another expert chat session at Mother's Yoga. Today I am joined by the wonderful Alicia from Mom's Milk. She is a midwife and also a lactation consultant with more than 15 years of experience. Today we are chatting about the basics of breastfeeding in which we are going to cover what is the importance of breastfeeding, its composition, feeding options, how can you prepare for breastfeeding during pregnancy and also where can you reach out for more help so it's going to be a wonderful session so stay tuned thank you alicia for joining us it's so wonderful to have you would you like to quickly tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do Hello, thank you, Regini, and uh, hi everybody. Lovely to be here and and share some uh, good old fashioned breastfeeding information live. Um, I guess just as by way of brief introduction to me, I, as Regini said, fifteen years uh, and more now uh, as a registered midwife, and then um, eight years ago I became an international board lactation. uh consultant and uh have been working uh within the environment of the Royal Women's Hospital as a lactation consultant and also in private practice with my colleague Darby. Yeah. So I love both of those environments in terms of um being able to support women to breastfeed. Being in a hospital environment means I'm with, you know, a lot of other learned colleagues and I I get to learn um lots of different we'll see lots of different um situations and and manage you know within a um a group of um lactation consultants anything that's a little bit more challenging which is fan- fantastic and then in private practice we have the luxury of sitting with someone you know in their home and really nutting out issues and um you know seeing if we can just um yeah keep women going with that breastfeeding sometimes they're nearly there and they just need reassuring and other people have much more complex issues that we need to sort of yeah sort through yeah that's wonderful that's wonderful alicia so uh, let us kick off this uh, chat today by just understanding the importance of breastfeeding so why is it so important So I guess it's one of those I I you know I've become quite passionate as a midwife about breastfeeding because it's one of those it's a species specific um uh process so you we as mammals human mammals we have this um magic superpower to be able to make breast milk and it's it's all that your baby needs so um for the first 6 months of life you've got it all there in these two fabulous packages <laughs> called breasts with that support early support if needed you know you you have that uh quick easy um biologically normal way of feeding your baby right there but it it's a learned skill and um you know baby has instinctive powers and instinctive um ways of learning and and you as a mum do too but support will go a long way to making that just a lot smoother yeah. so i think in terms of the importance if you know we often talk about breastfeeding being more than milk so it's nutrition but it's your baby being next to you ideally skin to skin um next to you means that they're warm they have security you smell very familiar and known to them you sound very familiar and known to them and as i say as as um newborn mammals we are quite needy and and this is you know home for a newborn baby in, including where the food is yeah yeah that's wonderful So Alicia mm-hmm. I I have heard like uh, the breast milk is actually rich in a lot of nutrients so would you like to tell us what is its composition really Sure so it, we were just briefly briefly talking before Regini about how much detail we could go into about yeah. what is in the breast milk and you know we just have this fabulous research that's ongoing in terms yeah. of exactly what it's made up of it's a very comprehensive fluid um and there are many many reference references you know to excellent research about just exactly what it is 
Um, the first and early breast milk is what's known as colostrum. So for anyone who's breastfed before, you'll you know this. Um, very small amounts, um, but full of the immune protective factors and the developmental factors that babies need to sort of really kick off their growth, you know, ex utero, as we say. Yeah. Um, these include the secretory IgA, lactoferrin and white blood cells. So they're just these critical elements to, you know, growth, but also setting a baby up to be yeah. um, protected, you know, in yeah. terms of infection, um, inflammation, etc. Um, and then in terms of breast milk, you know, it's made up of macronutrients. That's the fat, the protein, the carbohydrate, which is the lactose, um, and micronutrients. So there's vitamins and minerals um, within within that as well. Yeah. And we know that at any time, given time of the day, there will be higher or lower amounts of fat in the breast milk. Okay. Some people might know. That's um, interesting, yeah. Yeah, so I guess we, we know that we know that when a breast is less full, there is more fat content in the milk. Oh. But if it's more full, there'll be higher amounts of lactose. Okay. But any time your baby breastfeeds, that breast milk is incredibly important and yeah, perfectly matched to your baby. Okay. Mm. So there's one more kind of group of, of factors that it's called the biofactors and they're what we're finding more and more about um, living cells, antibodies, cytokines, growth factors and there's a new sort of um, a new uh, substance within breast milk that we call oligosaccharides and we think that they are part of um, feeding bacteria within the breast milk, within the gut that okay. then uh, helps, yeah, basically promote overall good health for a baby. So there's there's this very exciting yes. new factors that we're discovering. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so full of nutrients. Uh, Alicia, I just uh, recollected, yeah, I just recollected something. Uh, is, is it true? And it's a good uh, time to ask you. I've heard that at night, the bre uh, when you feed your baby, the breast milk uh, has some component that uh, helps the baby fall asleep is that true <laughs> so we think that's 24 hours a day basically yeah. yep so there's there's hormones that are basically also in breast milk um that baby gets certain amounts of yeah. and yes they're they're definitely there's a couple that definitely influence um a baby sleepiness you know along with the fact that they feel full you know when they've had enough to eat yeah. drink yeah yeah okay. so that's all all the all the you know um uh, round the clock round the clock <laughs> yeah okay yeah. and is it up to some age uh that uh you know like kids when they are six months they might not be so much used to like feeding and sleeping feeding and yeah. sleeping so uh is the release higher at night uh, so that they normally fall asleep or is it like you said it's throughout the day uh, not necessarily yeah it's it's throughout any time they feed and and the sort of day night rhythm becomes more um age appropriate rather than yeah the the hormonally driven okay factors yeah okay so their body cycle gets adjusted more so That's right. than uh, they relying on feeding to really fall asleep at night. Hormonal influence. Okay, gotcha. Now the next thing I would like to know is what are the feeding options for moms? So in your recommendation is breast milk the best or uh, if uh, somebody wants to mix feed, what is the recommendation from your side? And also if somebody cannot breastfeed uh, like they had don't have much supply so in that sure. case what is done sure so it, it's um i guess one of the things i would educate people about you know when they're thinking and talking with their partner about breastfeeding is is really looking at what their goals are for breastfeeding you know, it's it's really very individual for everybody. 
Um, and I think if you're both on the same page straight up, then that's always going to be easier. Um, uh, in terms of options, I mean, the, the, the big option and we think probably the most beneficial for a baby is exclusively breastfeeding at the breast. So baby on demand breastfeeding around the clock um, and, and ideally both sides and ensuring growth, you know, through all the good signs of output, weight gain, settled baby, um, you know, eight or more breastfeeds in a 24 hour period. That that's how you, yeah, that's how we grow um, a baby in, in terms of feeding at the breast, exclusively breast milk. Yeah. Um, some people do, uh, for all the different reasons, uh, look at trying to mix that that sort of feeding pattern by introducing um, some formula or even expressing some milk and, and having someone else give a bottle uh, either once a day or overnight. I guess, um, you know, I for me it's very important that if, if people are looking at that option that they're aware of the pros and cons of doing that. Um, you know, the... the the pros might be that you have to an extra sort of um, section of sleep in that 24 hour period. But my concern in terms of um, the breast milk supply is that you would still need to be expressing whenever you substitute a feed because that supply and demand is happening around the clock. And if we back off at all from, you know, having that regular stimulation of the supply, then we can see the supply drop back, you know, some for some people quite quickly and for others over time. Um, the other issue may be that if the milk's not moving regularly, then blockages and mastitis are a risk. Okay. And I guess the other thing that we see is that babies start to prefer the use of the teat in the bottle. So if that's part of their feeding regime, that can become, um, again, more quickly for some than others, something that they prefer. Having said that, there are families that manage to do this and, and you know, it, it tends to work out for them. Um, another option, I guess, is that uh, some people exclusively express their milk and give that milk via mm -hmm. a teat in a bottle. So then there's the option of someone else um, giving that feed and, and yeah, if okay. mum can wrangle it she can have more rest but still be able to keep the breast milk supply supported okay okay wonderful uh, mm. so w what else can women who are pregnant do during that phase to just prepare for breastfeeding it's we get asked this a lot and i think um it i think if you've breastfed before so if you're having your second or subsequent baby if there's been issues that you've had previously with with breastfeeding, I uh, I'd highly recommend you know depending on those issues, what yeah. they were, seeing an LC and being able to nut out you know just what the difficulties were and um, how you might make um, that easier this time. Yeah. Um, I think otherwise you know in terms physically there's not really a lot that you need to do to prepare for breastfeeding because really all the signals to start making milk mm -hmm. um, happen when the placenta is delivered so okay. once that happens you've got all the hormonal shifts and then you know postnatally you've got your baby skin to skin and you're feeding frequently and getting all the support you know yeah. for the positioning and an attachment mm -hmm. I think in terms of resourcing, there's lots you can do. So um, I think going back to those shared goals about what, what you're um, breastfeeding or how you're going to feed your baby mm -hmm. and having those, you know, agreement on those um, and then um, doing lots of reading. Like I'm a big sort of one for researching and reading as much as you feel comfortable yeah. And in, in a similar way that you seek out really positive stories about labour and birth, seek out positive stories about breastfeeding, you know. Mostly it works really well. Yeah. Don't sort of, yeah, listen too much to those really hard 
tragic, <laughs> difficult stories that, yeah, um, probably happen less than we think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing I love to mention is there's an amazing organisation called the Australian Breastfeeding Association. They have a, a very comprehensive website, but they also run antenatal classes. So okay. you can go along and learn about all the basics and actually have um, some time with a breastfeeding mum, IRL as they say, okay. and, and and see this baby there seeking, demanding, oh. feeding. Yeah, it's a great oh. concept and very yeah. helpful for people. Yeah. And do they have classes uh, like at multiple locations or uh, how does it work? I think that's the idea. COVID's okay. really kind of throwing things out, but I'm fairly sure they're back on track with those. So website, yeah, will give you um, ideally contacts regarding where and when. Yeah, yeah. And are there any other online resources that you can recommend? Because sometimes just going there and Googling can give you multiple uh, half uh, knowledge and maybe not true knowledge. So ABA is one. Agreed. Uh, ABA is just a brilliant resource. Um, I think the Royal Women's Hospital has has some really excellent. Um, I know I work there, but I know how much work goes into the information that goes up on the websites there. The the um, the handout sheets, all of that sort of stuff that you can access. Yeah. Um, look locally. Um, there are um, some LCs that have some really good information out there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to think locally. Look, my favourite one from OS, a US-based um, LC called uh, Kelly, um, oh, just forgotten her surname, but her site is called Kelly Mom. Okay. So K-E-L-L-Y-M-O-M. Okay. That's a very comprehensive, uh, excellent um uh, source that references all of our really good people in the field and, and the good research out there. Okay, that's wonderful. Videos, etc. Yeah. Wonderful. So, uh, like you said, if it's a second time or a third time mum, she sort of knows what to expect. Uh, but mm. what about a first time mum? Like, to what extent should she prepare? Uh, because I remember when I was a f when it was my first time, my midwife did tell me to prepare about breastfeeding. I just picked up a book and um, I I didn't find it very interesting. Like I just read a little bit here and there, and just attended uh, like the antenatal class in my hospital where they just give you a little bit of idea mm. about how to hold the baby and but not in that much detail mm. uh, yeah but mm. uh, uh, what preparation should a new t a new mom uh, at least have you know in her back pocket <laughs> in case something doesn't work what's your suggestion on yeah that? look I think I think um, that ABA class I mentioned I think is okay. super valuable because I know the hospitals do cover you know, breastfeeding in the antenatal um, education, but um, it can often be, yeah, super brief and, and you know, not give you a huge sort of idea. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a great idea if you can, if you can, you know, um, afford the resources to even talk to a, a, um, an LC antenatally, you know, have an, L, uh, an LC appointment and talk through what your goals are, yeah. what what to expect and you know I guess um, have someone lined up as well in case things do go you know pear-shaped postnatally yeah. yeah. and you know sometimes there may be concerns that, that some women may have with their breasts you know for example smooth nipples um, you know some people refer to them as flat I think that's not a very helpful word but if we have that knowledge in advance we can maybe look at the idea of a nipple shield and prepare a little bit differently for that baby to attach effectively to the breast. Okay. So those sort of issues can be covered and, and prepared mm. for. Mm. Nice. So at what, uh, how many weeks of pregnancy is it ideal to see a lactation consultant to chat about these things? That's a good question. I think, um, I think you, often it's best, I think, with a lot of antenatal education to sort of wait as late as you can. Okay. you know maybe sort of late 20s early 30s in terms of weeks okay. you know so that you are not too early 
and then you are not too close to the to birth time labor and birth time yeah oh. so 30 32 34 weeks it depends on people's schedules too you know yeah how yeah. busy they are yeah yeah right that's true so uh, mm. i think alicia you did cover this uh, bit uh, this part in a in the uh, in the previous question how can we prepare mm. but uh, do you have any tips to where can women reach out for help if they are getting any troubles with breastfeeding you did mention mm -hmm. a lactation consultant but i just wanted yeah. to understand after you have birth in a say just example public or a private hospital it's the midwives mm -hmm. who help you and then yes. uh, say if i re if i come home and i feel like this is still difficult who where do i go for help uh, and whom do i approach first Yes. So ideally in hospital, you know, you do have that midwife support. It's within the midwifery scope of practice to know about breastfeeding and to be able to support breastfeeding. Yeah. Um, many hospitals have lactation consultants on staff. So if you do feel like it's getting a bit more complex or there's history or then, you know, feel free to ask for a referral to one of those, you know, LCs in hospital. Okay. I think once you get home, the maternal child health nurse is really your next sort of community support yeah. and uh, in Victoria they are midwives as well so they do have some breastfeeding knowledge yeah. and some are also LCs so okay. that's super helpful if they yeah. are um, yeah. and within some local government areas they have LCs on on staff on the maternal child health nurse staff so there may be an opportunity to come to a drop-in morning, um, yeah. a, a session where you drop in literally and, and yeah, you have your feet observed or ask some questions. Okay. Um, I guess the next option there would be the Australian Breastfeeding Association uh, have a hotline. So that's a 24-hour service that you can phone and get support from. Yeah. They also have a newish sort of chat function. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you, you, if you join the ABA, you can actually go along to a local group um, very regularly and meet with other new mums in your area where they have a trained counsellor um, okay. attending. So there's, there's lots of information, you know, that can come through them and support through them as well. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess, you know, failing that, it, a lactation consultant in private practice the, and there's lots of those around, um, mm -hmm. they are able to come to your home. Okay. Which is what we guys, what we do. Yeah. Um, or yeah. some people have clinics that you can go to. And okay. the way you can find them is through um, a website that I can share with you, Regine, for example, that where, yeah, mums put in the postcode and it gives you a list of people closest to you in the area. Okay. So private lactation consultants in the area. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There are also some GPs that have become lactation consultants um, as well in in Melbourne, and they can become you know super a super good resource, especially if we need medication or or any yeah. um, tongue tie assessment release that sort of thing. Okay. That's wonderful. Uh, I, I did not know so much about the GPs and uh, I think my knowledge was very limited to midwife and then the MCH and uh, the lactation consultants referred through the hospital. But um, yeah, so yes, uh, yeah. and that's ideal. I mean, you want that. really. Mm, yeah, so uh, just wanted to know in a private lacta as a private lactation consultant how do women normally come to you like uh, is it and at what stage uh, do women normally come to you yeah so um they they come through that website i talked about yeah, so yeah. it's called find a lactation consultant mm -hmm. um so they can get to look at all of our different websites and decide what they think you know might suit them yeah. um they we often get friends and family recommending us you know through their own experience mm -hmm. um some maternal child health nurses will refer 
uh, lactation consultants that they know. Um, There are some private obstetricians also that have some lactation consultants that they know and, yeah, um, happily refer out to when things are getting more complex. Okay, yeah, that's good to know. So, yeah. uh, Alicia, if our moms want to reach out to you, how and where can they find you and which are the areas that you uh, work in? Sure. So, I, so there's two of us. Um, I am based in Northcote and so that means I'm, you know, ideally covering that sort of northern part of Melbourne, but I also go out west um, and, yeah, a little bit more east. And Darby's based in um, Elstonwick, so she covers the southern area and, yeah, up into the eastern areas as well. Um, We also do virtual consults as well for people who can't travel or for less complex um, issues. Um, We have a a website, mumsmilk.com, and um, there's some great information on there and some information on us um and yeah what we do we we have a bit of a um uh, an adjunct to our breastfeeding support in the the low level laser therapy so that's a um a form of laser light that we can use to accelerate the healing of damaged nipples Mm -hmm. or um mastitis blockages um and yeah if if even wound infections those sort of situations we can use the laser with Okay, yeah, that's great. Uh, so Alicia, coming on to the questions that our members have asked, uh, one of our members wanted to know, like, he's a vegeta- vegeta- he eats vegetarian food, so would you have any tips uh, or any top five foods that are recommended for vegetarian mums to improve the breast milk supply? Mm, okay, interesting question. So, um, so in terms of being vegetarian and breastfeeding, that certainly doesn't contraindicate breastfeeding. Yeah. Um, we we would uh, make sure that you know, I guess, just being aware of any potential de- uh, um, deficiencies that you know um, that the mum might have. So. Iron is a common one, even for people who do eat meat. Um, so it might be worth just being aware of your, your iron levels, your hemoglobin levels, so that you've got good energy to get through, you know, your, your new challenges. Um, B12, I guess, is an, and you know, m- mum might be aware of this already, but B12 is another one that can be challenging for people to um, be, you know, have sufficient on board. Um, and vitamin D, I guess, is the other one that, you know, we have lots of, um, it's very common to be vitamin D deficient anyway, but particularly in pregnancy. So those are the things that you might think about um, having checked and screened and, and maybe a supplement for. Okay. Um, in terms of increasing breast milk supply, there's, there's sort of mixed good evidence out there um it's i think first of all it's really important to know that you need enough calories and it's it's um quite a bit more than being pregnant that you need in terms of intake when you're breastfeeding so there's a lot more energy um, used to to produce milk and to feed a baby so that's really important you know eat eat to hunger and and keep hydrated um I think mainly breast milk supply works on supply and demand. So that's really the most important thing to keep in mind and to eat well. And that's, you know, all the, all the food groups that you do eat and, um, you know, vegetables in those really super important ones and protein of some sort, whatever your protein is very yeah. important in terms of, you know, um, supporting a lower milk supply, Oats is something that there is a little bit of evidence for, uh, hence, you know, the sort of trend around um, um, booby bickies, for yeah. example. So biscuits made of oats. 
um, that people tend to end up eating a lot of because they feel that that's going to help supply. There's very little evidence for that, but I think, you know, if you wanted to eat more oats in your diet, like porridge or, um, you know, anything, you know, with oats in it, that's certainly not going to hurt. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's good to know. And I've heard fenugreek as well improves. Mm. Have you heard that as well? I mean, is, is mm. there enough evidence to say fenugreek helps or? There's not no. really great not evidence really? for no, it. Oh, okay. okay. No, but no. you know, anecdotally, anecdotally and, and the same for booby bickies, you know, um, these things can work for people. And so if, if that happens, fantastic, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, mm. So the next question is from a second time mum and she actually says that uh, she was breastfeeding and then for a period because the baby wasn't uh, sleeping in the cot and she decided to switch to formula for that night so that the baby would sleep and not get up, up, get up for feet. But then eventually after mm -hmm. a few few weeks she realized that the baby was refusing breast milk so is that something that's common and can happen or uh, is there something called so I just, I just confusion or something because yes uh, yes so that's the teat preference that I talked about before so okay. we we either call it teat preference or some people call it nipple confusion Okay. So, yeah, with the introduction of a nipple, there's always, with a teat, there's always that risk that a baby um, will start to prefer that way of feeding because it's generally um, very easy, you know, okay. particularly if um, if the, the parents are not thinking necessarily about how slow that the milk might be flowing and, and giving the baby breaks and mm. those sorts of things, which is what we call paste bottle feeding. Okay. Um, yeah, they'll they'll start. We think that when a baby breastfeeds, they use a huge amount of musculature within their face, neck, mm -hmm. even into their head. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the bottle, it's very few muscles around the mouth that they use oh, okay. to get what they need. Yeah, and is it also Alicia that it's a bit easier from the bottle, whereas uh, it's more effort, and that's why they they feel it's. It's coming easily from the bottle, so they start. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That that sums up what I what I was explaining. They don't have to do much work at much all. Much work. <laughs> okay, yeah. That's wonderful. Uh, mm. I, I, now the last question probably is from me, and we were chatting a little bit about it. Uh, how mm -hmm. can partners play a, a bit more of involved role in? this breastfeeding journey um, so what's your recommendation yeah. how can we involve them I think good question and I think um, it, it goes a little bit back to what I was saying before in terms of goals having shared goals about how you want to breastfeed or how you want to feed your baby mm -hmm. um, if that support for breastfeeding is there from your partner um, we know that women are going to, we know through good research that women are going to feed more effectively and for longer, which mm -hmm. means better, much more, you know, um, benefits for baby and mum in that case. So when you've got that support um, from your partner, I think that's really kind of critical, you know, number one. We know that the women that don't have that support will, yeah, much more quickly wean and not enjoy it you know in terms of yes you know if if together even before baby's born you make a special uh, feeding space it might be the couch that you sort of take over in the short term so lots of support cushions a warm room uh, things like food and drink and you know whatever else is needed so that mum's comfortable and, and you know able to just focus on that feeding I think you know from there we want a partner that's able to sort of take care of the washing, um, cooking, you know, having food, good meals prepared or facilitating others doing that, um, you know, cleaning the house. So 
even changing baby's nappy, that sort of thing, so that mum can really focus on recovering from the birth and then just being skin to skin, one to one with baby and, and breastfeeding skills and establishing that milk supply. It sounds a bit dull and boring, but I think it's it's so critical because you, you kind of in this, this big new challenging space and you just need to get the fundamentals happening really, don't you? Yeah, correct. Alicia, mm. we have one last question coming in, which says that, uh, do you recommend having support and pillows while feeding? Uh, because uh, probably this person's physio suggested that try using your arm strength to hold the baby. Uh, that's better to develop that arm strength. So that's why they're asking, should they go for pillows and support or should they like really use that arm strength? What's your suggestion there? That's that's a great question. I think um, I can see where the physio is coming from because you will be using your forearms and shoulders and neck and all those, you know, um, parts of those limbs that you haven't used as, as um, much before. So I think there's a lot in that, being able to, to get used to that. And you will just naturally, I think, as a new mum. Okay. Um, I think with feeding and then with the positions that I sort of support women with really there's not a lot of um, commercial breastfeeding cushion um, necessity okay. for me it's more you know whatever arm is supporting that baby you might just have your own cushion there to support the arm because yeah. that then leads up to shoulder and neck support and that's really important that you're fully stabilised and supported when you're feeding. Oh, Does that make oh. sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, I am. I liked having cushions, especially in those first few weeks when I was probably recovering. Yes. And once I was up on my feet, yes. on my feet, I could like feed my baby standing or doing some work. <laughs> so I exactly. Think, we developed the strength it's just yeah. in the first few weeks that you know you a little bit of cushion a little bit of yeah. support wouldn't hurt but yeah it needs uh i'm i of felt course. that yeah i felt having a good posture was quite important because very easily it could be hunching and have uh, yeah. back pain and shoulder stiffness so yeah that's wonderful uh, all right, Alicia, I think that yeah. was uh, our list yes. of questions. And I will also leave your details below the video so that if somebody needs to get in touch, they can. Um, Fantastic. Well, it, yeah. Well, it was wonderful having you, Alicia. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your knowledge on this topic. And it's such a huge topic. It's so difficult to cover it in one session. And we are really looking forward <laughs> to you joining us for our upcoming sessions and just making this uh, big breastfeeding topic into small chunks that people can easily absorb. So we can't wait to have you again with us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rugini. It was a pleasure. Hey, Mamas. I hope you really enjoyed this session and got lots out of it. If you have any questions for me or for Alicia, don't forget to write it down in the comments below. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye.